Thanks so much for joining me here today um, for my talk on building AWS Lambda functions from container images. Yeah, it's super great to be part of the AWS User Group UK. My name is Julian Wood. I'm based in London, and I'm a senior developer advocate here at AWS Serverless, which means I work within part of a team within the wider serverless applications team to help people fall in love with serverless as I have. Today, I'm going to be talking about a really awesome capability for Lambda, which is one of our serverless compute offerings at AWS, which is literally nearly seven years old already. And it's grown to then become an incredibly popular service with uh, many of our customers. Now, many of you have made big investments in container tooling, development workflows, and expertise as you start to modernize existing applications or build new ones. But you and uh, likely your other development teams in your orgs have found it difficult to leverage your container investments and know-how when using Lambda. And so to help with this, Lambda now enables you to package and deploy functions as container images, and I'll cover what that all means. From a high level, which is actually a pretty simple idea, a Lambda serverless application is event-driven and composed of three things. An event source, this is something happening, can be a file uploaded, a database record updated, or something uh, appearing in a queue. Uh, basically, some change in a resource. And this event triggers a function, which is code you've written, which is your business logic, which reacts to the event. And this can be written in one of six, what we call runtimes, uh, supporting various languages. And you can also bring your own runtime to uh, basically run any language in Lambda. The function can then go and perform whatever it needs to do. That may be updating another database record or returning something to a client or talking to another API or endpoint somewhere. Now, Lambda, uh, again, is a compute service, so it itself is running on top of underlying compute resources. Yes, they are actually servers running in serverless, but you don't have to think about them. You don't have to manage them. You don't have to scale them yourselves or pay for idle for them or deal with high availability. A Lambda function itself is just some code. This code has a handler function, which is the main entry point into your function code. And this is the business logic of the code that you've written. There's an event object, which is the uh, event that triggers the Lambda function. This is the data you want to send to the Lambda function to do some sort of processing. And uh, uh, then there's also a context object. And this has got some methods and properties that can give info about the invocation, uh, about the function, and the Lambda environment. Uh, as Lambda now has this functionality, I'm going to start why you may even want to consider Lambda in the first place, particularly if you come from a container world. And I'll go through the benefits of this new container image support. <clears throat> I'll show you how to build and work with container images with Lambda, go through the developer workflow, and then level set a bit and show what changes and what stays the same with the rest of how Lambda works. So development teams that currently use containers might ask the question, why Lambda? Well. <clears throat> As a compute option, Lambda has several interesting and quite unique uh, things going on about it. First, it's the general compute option that provides the greatest level of operational support by AWS. It's been designed to simplify the implementation of high availability, scale, and security within an application. <clears throat> so teams who do want to shift the greatest amount of undifferentiated heavy lifting to AWS often start with Lambda. Now, AWS does have many compute services across the spectrum of operational support. You can start with, uh, with EC2, where you have all the knobs and levers you want. Um, uh, but then teams who want to shift the greatest amounts of the heavy lifting onto AWS, as I said, then start with Lambda, which has uh, where Lambda, AWS takes on more of that operational support. <clears throat> Now, we often talk about the AWS shared responsibility model with our managed container services, what we manage on your behalf and what you manage. And you can see here, if you're using managed containers, there's sort of a divide at the OS and network config level of the stack. But when you use Lambda, we take on even more of the operational aspect, and you get more time to focus on your business components. And let us look after more of the infrastructure for you. Another major differentiator for Lambda is its integrations with other services. It's like more than 200 now without you having to manage any code or applications to run these integrations. And these integrations are, provide a wide range of convenience in how do you interact with them. These could be polling, batching, queuing, event routers, retries. And you get a lot of these features for free with Lambda. And they can add maturity to your applications built using Lambda as a compute option in an event-driven architecture.
Lambda also has unique auto-scaling characteristics. This means it can burst capacity where Lambda can scale from zero to 3,000 concurrent uh, invocations immediately within seconds. And then after the initial burst, you can then scale by another 500 concurrent instances every minute. So if you've got unpredictable on-demand workloads that can benefit from rapid scaling, Lambda is a good choice. There's also a feature called provision concurrency, which means you can ramp up these workloads in, in advance if, you're, if they can be planned ahead of time. Lambda's billing model is also unique. With Lambda, you never pay for idle resources since Lambda only charges you for what you use in one millisecond increments, and it scales to zero when it's not needed. And you can manage the cost and performance of your functions by allocating memory, which proportionally adds uh, CPU. And of course, with Lambda, you can avoid paying the human cost of patching and maintaining servers. So let's look at some of the benefits of packaging your Lambda functions as container images. Lambda container image support enables you to play the flexibility and familiarity of the container tooling, including Docker, container-based CI/CD workflows, uh, you know, it could be your security and governance tools, and match it with the operational simplicity of Lambda. And this is all in order to achieve greater agility when building your applications. One of the common challenges customers have found with managing the lifecycle of a Lambda function, as well as managing how they install software into their Lambda environment. So with Lambda in the past, it hasn't always been the simplest process to do that. There were, of course, tools and ways you could import, you could import code, uh, but this could be simplified. So uh, with this new feature, dependency management now works just like it does with other container systems. You build an artifact from a Docker file where you manage all your dependencies, and you can use your package manager of a choice. So you can use NPM packages or pip install, or there's Maven for Java, uh, for .NET, NuGet, Ruby as Gems, uh, and so forth. And you can install native operating system packages as you do with any Linux distro, things like low-level code libraries or full applications. And you can build your images exactly the way you like them and will ensure the software runs as you expect from your laptop to production. And you get to use your familiar and favorite container tooling that you've probably already been using if you've been building container-based apps. Now, you can share that same tooling with Lambda, things like the Docker CLI, and makes it much easier to use the same tooling for both. <clears throat> you can store your Lambda application artifacts in the same registries as your container, container artifacts. And this also allows you to now use the same uh, container security scanning. And you know maybe you've got some other governance tools that you already have in your container world, and now you can use it with Lambda as well. Now, one thing you will definitely benefit from is the option to run larger workloads on Lambda. And uh, last year, Lambda increased several limits. With zip archive functions, it was 250 meg. And with container image functions, it's up to 10 gig. And, that, and you can also run a Lambda function using up to 10 gig of memory. And that's also proportionally up to six virtual CPUs. So these uh, changes really make Lambda a great choice for both compute intensive as well as memory intensive workloads. <clears throat> and you know, if you've got some big uh, libraries like PyTorch, TensorFlow, or machine learning models, uh, you can use that larger storage space, which means Lambda may now be a great option for your workloads. Another benefit is immutability, which I touched on before. So Lambda treats uh, container images as a mutability, uh, immutable entities. <clears throat> when invoked, Lambda uh, functions are deployed as container image are, are just run exactly as they are. So you can feel confident that your functions are immutable across different environments. This is you know, on your laptop or your desktop, within your CI CD process, within the registry, and in the Lambda execution environment. Now, with this immutability does come a little bit more responsibility. Uh, OS and runtime patching are no longer performed by AWS, and so you don't benefit from some of the security patching uh, up front. Any, image to the, uh, any changes to the image require a separate redeployment step, which you will ne then need to uh, bake into your operational procedures. <clears throat> and because you own that runtime, you also own the container image, and so you don't get the automatic updates to the runtime. Now, this is an important caveat from before. With zip archive functions, the runtime was automatically updated. That automatically updating is not always ideal. <clears throat> if you had an app that was very tied to maybe a specific release of uh, the runtime or a dependency, uh, when, we, uh, when we update the runtime on your behalf, that could break your function. And unfortunately, that's happened to customers. So one of the things with container image support is you can take on the ownership of updating that runtime. So when there are performance fixes, security or bug fixes, or new runtime version, that's now on you to update these container images by uh, creating a new version of your function and then using the latest build. 
but that also means that you can uh, pass that new function through your testing pipeline and make sure any updates don't cause anything you don't want before moving it into production. So it's important to understand that bit, which is a sort of change and shift with the way Lambda's done things before. Now, you certainly get more flexibility. You can use your preferred Linux-based images, which you may be using elsewhere, to also now deploy Lambda-based applications. And there's a runtime interface emulator, I'll talk about that later, that simplifies running images locally and on other compute services. And those other compute options give you, you know, cool portability. You can uh, create Lambda functions that can also run in other places like Fargate and EC2 and on-prem or uh, somewhere in a hybrid cloud. Now, this isn't, of course, running the whole Lambda environment with all its integrations and scale and availability, but it does mean your actual Lambda function code can be used elsewhere and is way more portable. So how does it all work? Well, Lambda supports the Docker image manifest scheme and the OCI spec. And as I mentioned, you can also use non-Amazon Linux distros to build your apps, which can be up to 10 gig in size. So previously, you did need to use Amazon Linux or Amazon Linux 2, which is our own long-term supported uh, Linux distros. Now Lambda can support all Linux distros, so you can build your functions of Alpine, uh, Debian, and Ubuntu, uh, or whatever you want. Lambda supports container image deployments from the Elastic Container Registry, and think of this in a way which is similar to Docker Hub with public and private registries. And you can share your images across accounts and publicly and replicate them across regions. And there are also great security controls baked in. You've got encryption at rest and in motion and also integrated vulnerability scanning. So base images. Lambda provides a variety of uh, curated container-based images for each runtime, and these are patched and main maintained by AWS. This allows you to easily take your existing code for Lambda and combine it with a container image for the language that the code's programmed for, and you build these images at build time. And you can get the base images from Docker Hub and Amazon ECR uh, public. <clears throat> and as I have said, you can now provide your own base, base images rather than the default uh, Amazon Linux ones, and you can also use, which is called cool, uh, Docker's multi-stage builds to manage the content of your images. So looking a bit more detail at what a Docker file for a Lambda function uh, looks like. This is a bare bones example, just four lines, uses Node.js base image from Amazon ECR public. Uh, the function application code in app.js is copied with a package.json, uh, and that's you know, obviously where all the dependencies are. And then the standard uh, Node npm install runs, and this adds the dependencies from the package.json, and then the CMD line uh, points uh, to the file and the application's handler. And this is the code the Lambda function runs during an uh, invocation. So the container image artifact includes your function code, plus all the dependencies, and the image becomes the entire file system. You can specify the container image settings in your Docker file when you build your image. Lambda supports uh, entry point CMD, Workdir, and ENV, and you can override these. And Lambda does actually ignore the values of any other container image settings in the Docker file as they aren't supported. So remember, Lambda works in an event-driven model where functions are invoked based on an event rather than a port and socket, which may be used, used to with um, containers. Now, part of Lambda uh, image support brings two uh, new open source components, the RIC and the RE. Now, RICs are the runtime interface clients, and these are wrappers that act like a shim to integrate your function code with the Lambda service at runtime. Uh, the RE is the runtime interface emulator, and this is a small app that acts as a little web server inside your container. And you can use this to emulate the Lambda service to test your functions locally or to run your function in other environments. So let's look at the workflow to get your code for, into a container image and running in Lambda. <clears throat> you start by writing the code for your Lambda function, you know, using your IDE of choice, and then you write a standard Docker file. This pulls the base image, as I showed before, copies the function code, installs dependencies. You then use a, ooh, I've just jumped. You then use a Docker build to create the function image. And again, you can use Docker's multi-stage builds to squash unnecessary layers, uh, useful, useful for removing, removing some build steps. <clears throat> then you can test this function using the local image, and you can use Docker run with the runtime interface emulator. You know, you invoke a function and pass it an event and monitor the output, a sort of easy and quick way to quickly iterate on your code. Uh, the uh, function can also interact with other cloud resources, so you don't have to locally mock other, mock other services, which gives the best of both, of both worlds. Now, AWS SAM is our serverless-specific infrastructure as code framework, and that, that makes it even easier to build uh, serverless applications. Uh, you can use SAM build for the build process and SAM locally invoke for the testing. 
And uh, yeah, really good uh, tool if you haven't seen it. AWS SAM makes it really easy to build Lambda applications and other service apps too. Then you tag and upload it to ECR, and this is typically by calling uh, Docker push. Uh, next, you create the Lambda function with any tool you normally use. The Lambda service creates a function, uh, pulls the image from ECR, and optimizes it to speed up performance and cold starts. <clears throat> if you did use uh, AWS SAM build before, the infrastructure as code tool to package the image, you can actually use SAM deploy, which then auto tags and pushes the image to a repo and creates or updates the Lambda function in one command. Super easy. So it's worth also level setting to see what changes and what actually stays the same. The main new changes are larger function sizes up to 10 gig and being able to use your own Linux based images with the RIC to talk to the Lambda service and using the Reef for local testing and portability. Then I spoke about immutability, which is helpful, but does mean you need to manage the updates to your function. But a lot of Lambda also stays the same, including the operational and invoke model. You're still limited to 15 minutes of maximum function duration, the bursts and the account limits, how the performance works, storage, observability, limits, and pricing. All the good old things with Lambda stay the same. Just on performance, uh, memory and CPU configurations for container images match the larger function options I went through previously. Now, of course, the performance of any Lambda function is going to vary based on you know, the size of the image, how it's built, the runtimes, the dependencies, and there are great resources out there to help you with optimizing this. Now, cold start times, which generally only impact a very small percentage of production traffic, are targeted to be the same with the, between zip archive functions and container image functions due to the way we cache the larger images locally uh, closer to where the Lambda function runs. Pricing is the same for Lambda. We now build it one millisecond granularity. Uh, with container images, there are no additional Lambda pricing changes or dimensions. But one thing to mention is you do actually pay for uh, storing the images, uh, which is in a separate service in ECR. And importantly, the Lambda resource and operational models are exactly the same for container images, uh, you know, including auto-scaling characteristics, the same burst mode I spoke about. High availability is the same, uh, including Lambda by default working across multiple availability zones, so your, uh, your multi-AZ story is covered. And the same good security models as well as the function isolation, which is super strong, are the same. <laughs> So we now have three different models to create and package your functions. You can still use the Lambda console. You can still use zip archives and now container image support, which brings even more flexibility and size to build and run Lambda functions. So to summarize, container image support gives you some more options and can simplify the way you build Lambda-based applications. You can combine the flexibility and familiarity of container tooling with the operational simplicity of Lambda, a good two for one there, giving you greater agility and a simplified developer experience when building your applications. And certainly try out, try out um, AWS SAM too. Uh, there's much more information and more blogs, videos, and other material to digest via the link and the QR code, which I have shown over here. For plenty more information on all things serverless, we have a super aggregation site called serverlessland.com. This has lots of resources, blogs, videos, workshops, and learning paths. It's really everything about serverless on AWS. So thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I really hope I was uh, able to uh, show some light on how Lambda works, how the Lambda container image works, and how you get the benefits of both worlds. Um, you can contact me uh, uh, on Twitter at Julian underscore Wood if you've got questions about the presentation today or questions about general serverless development. So I am available here for questions afterwards. So anything you have immediately, you can uh, contact me. But yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's super cool to be part of the AWS uh, UK user group. Seen up being in London, it feels local, and it's so nice to be able to be with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian, who uh, is joining me right now uh, from Skype. Uh, hello, Julian. Whereabouts are you in in actual physical terms? I am well. I'm physically sitting on my <laughs> chair in my house. <laughs> right. No, I'm, I'm in West London, so I am uh, I'm in the UK. Um, gotcha. Yeah, Excellent stuff. Uh, last time I uh, I did a Q and A with someone who was from uh, from Amazon uh, from AWS themselves. Uh, her power went out and she disconnected from the internet, and I had oh, to no. style it out for about a minute or so before she joined uh, from her phone in the dark. So let's hope that doesn't happen this time. Um, <laughs> Okay, John, I would love to see you doing some serverless <laughs> interpretive dance, but uh, yeah, if not, yeah, you know, exactly. Okay, well, um, you so uh, you mentioned in the in your uh, your presentation about the um, how you can adopt um, 
pre pre canned um base images to build your lambdas from but then you would then you also kind of are responsible for maintaining and, and keeping those up to date have you seen any kind of creative solutions for triggering that sort of thing automatically uh when when new versions of the of the upstream is published what does that look like yeah definitely yeah uh, it, it takes a sort of bit of an ad- I suppose a bit of an advanced, more advanced pipeline than you than you normally do. Um, but people want that control, and so they're happy to take on that responsibility. So I have seen people who are building into their CI/CD pipelines. They're able to realize when new versions of the base images are um, uploaded into either ECR or Docker Hub, and they can run some sort of workflow that triggers that off. They then deploy a particular Lambda function, or maybe a whole application into some <laughs> some sort of test account. They can run their unit tests, run the integration tests all the way through. And yeah, we have actually, I have seen one or two customers myself that sort of then have the, I suppose, the, the comfort when that all works to just automatically deploy that uh, into production. You know, and you can do it via either some canaries or either some sort of rollout deployments. So, yeah, so some people are doing it, or well, some people also just taking it easy and they trying it out themselves on their laptop. If they're happy, it all works, they, they do it. And maybe they'll do it, they'll do that once a week or once every two weeks. Um, yeah, up to you. The, the, the toys yeah, are there. Great stuff. Well, I guess that 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 sort of um, that sort of problem solving is what I think uh, I find really interesting about cloud stuff. As plugging together those, oh, this event says that this thing's updated, and so now this thing can happen, and so forth, which is really very kind of lambda oriented thinking, right? What well, what sort of cool things have you seen customers build with uh, with lambda, or things that are maybe slightly out of the ordinary that you wouldn't necessarily expect? Yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting question from two points of view. Is is one we see the the interesting things with Lambda as with uh, this container image also brought uh, much bigger functions. So you know, uh, ten gig of memory, six virtual CPUs, uh, also ten gig of storage. So yes, yeah, so we seeing some sort of weird and weird, wonderful and crazy, you know, machine learning or some uh, not even machine learning if that's not your thing, but some sort of scientific analysis things that people are running. You know, particularly with Python, they've got these big chunky dependencies that you've got us previously had to shoe on in weird under. Uh, so, so now you can do that. So all kind of things. But I'm also loving the way that people are also understanding how they don't necessarily have to have Lambda in the mix and they can build event-driven applications connecting uh, different services together and not actually have Lambda. And that may sound as a bit of heresy of like, what on earth? You're talking about Lambda and then talking about not having to use Lambda. But yeah, that, that sort of is the power of uh, AWS as a platform, that they're cool ways to integrate things. And then also, you know, Lambda is still super powerful, super important to be able to connect different, uh, different things together so yeah we, we see weird and wonderful stuff all the time um yeah some some amazing um like you know even the bbc for example builds a whole bunch of their web pages mm-hmm. using lambda so they don't necessarily have to serve them from lambda but they can build and generate um you know html content from lambda yeah i mean they're, they're, they're game sites there are you know uh, live video streaming things, yep. whole bunch of things. It's, it's sort of uh past the stage now where um you I guess when when Lambda was first introduced, you maybe would only want to consider it for very specific types of workloads. But the the reduction in uh, in cold start times and the and the sort of resource constraints that have been lifted are now sort of mean that's uh, that that's less true, and you can pretty much build anything in that way. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's just the, the, the advantages are just so. Once people people sort of often spend a lot of time when they don't understand Lambda in advance going, yes, what it, well, it does this, it doesn't do this. But because it's so simple to actually just try it, even in the Lambda console to create a, uh, a Lambda function, you know, do an event trigger, which, you know, something triggers it, people then start to see the power of this sort of event-driven model. And that's actually, I mean, Lambda was never really, uh, when announced in 2014, it was never sort of a serverless thing. It was all about event driven and it came from the s3 org where the s3 organization said well when people upload something to s3 we want some computer run and people got together and thought that's going to be a good idea but why just have that for s3 let's have it for you know a whole bunch of services and that was sort of the genesis of, of lambda you know that it becoming serverless uh, came along later but yeah I really believe that in the next, well, starting already, but so, certainly over the next few years, you know, companies are really going to think about the power of events in their applications and how events are going to be passed around rather than, you know, a port in a socket or, you know, IP addressing or, you know, operating systems or even... Right, yeah. So, I mean, event, event-driven programming isn't necessarily new, but it, it's um, certainly my experience of dealing with um, uh, software teams is that that's not necessarily the first 
way that people think about solving problems and it seems seems to me that with with, with lambda being yeah. being event driven it's sort of pushing people into thinking about things things differently is, is this sort of is this come from the aws world is, every, is everything inside aws kind of event driven and so that's sort of informing how these things are built or or, or is that not necessarily the case um I think it's a. I think it's a bit of both. I think obviously um, at reInvent last year, then uh, Chief Honja, uh, Chief Honja Angie Jassy said that um, half of all the applications that AWS build internally use Lambda in some way, shape, or form. Um, so yeah, Lambda is obviously getting huge traction internally, and that ties directly into the uh, event-driven model. But I, I think as companies and you know governments and uh, you know nonprofits and you know there could be enterprises and startups anyway are starting to. Really Realize that they need to um, they need to respond much more quickly. They need to be more you know agile to use the term. I don't mean that in software development, but more from a, a business perspective that they've got to uh, they've got to um, respond to things really quickly. That you know naturally they're going to start breaking apart parts of their application because they need different security or different scale and those kind of things. And so once they do that, well, they've now got to connect all these different parts together, and that's when events sort of become uh, powerful. And previously, you had to have a server that would wait for an event that would have a polling task that would do something, you know, and that was a bit clunky and a bit hard work to do. So when you have a, an event-driven model built into a platform like Lambda, which just automatically responds to events happening, you know, a file in S3, a database record, something in a stream, uh, and can just then do something on that. Uh, once the light bulbs go off, then people are like, "Whoa, whoa this <laughs> yeah. is cool." So, um, Mark has asked it in the uh, in the chat a, a question that I think has come up previously, and, and there's maybe sort of uh, uh, slightly. I get either contentious or, or, or difficult to define topic, but um, Mark's sort of saying like, "Is serverless just Lambda, or is it more than Lambda? What do we what do we actually mean by serverless?" Absolutely, that's uh, that's something I uh, I cover in a, a lot of things I talk about, um, and it's sort of where I was talking initially about. Well, uh, Lambda was announced, you know, seven years ago, nearly now, as uh, event-driven computing. So, you know, where the heck did, did um, serverless come in? And I like to think of if you think as as Lambda as a a product um, functions as a service, uh, if you want, it's a way to run compute in the cloud. Um, and that is part of a bigger sort of sphere of influence, which is called event-driven computing, which is then part of an even bigger sphere of influence called uh, serverless computing. So serverless it can be very general. Now, it's sort of, if you think back to the early days of cloud, where people are like, well, what on earth does cloud mean? It's, this is amorphous, um, silly name. You know, the marketers really had no idea what that is. You know, serverless is sort of that thing. And it's it's sort of fungi by design because it could be anything. And the idea is that you don't have servers or pods or clusters or stuff to manage. And so that can be general. That could be a database. That could be a, a message queue. That could be uh, an event route. It could be a notification system. So it is vague, but I think let's not get bogged down by it being vague, just like cloud can be vague, and we sort of understand what, what that is now. So serverless is the bigger picture of just being able to, in fact, move the undifferentiated heavy lifting onto someone else. And then uh, part of that is event-driven computing, and Lambda's the compute that makes that yeah, happen. Yeah, gotcha. That all makes sense. Yeah, I think I, I was initially thrown by the idea that... Um, <laughs> You know, Fargate, for example, could be serverless, or Aurora could be serverless. I wonder what does that even mean? But I, I, I think I've sort of set, set, yeah. got to some comfort by thinking it's an operating system I don't have to patch, and it's resources I don't have to provision. And in in, in those two cases, you sort of remove a huge amount of, um, as you say, undifferentiated, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, that uh, that means that your dev teams can do things that are more valuable. Is is kind of my how I pitch it essentially. Yeah, definitely. Um, Cool. Someone on uh, on the chat is uh, offering the opportunity to buy followers and viewers. Uh, Paul, would you remove oh, that, uh, that individual? <laughs> we don't need to. We don't <laughs> need to buy followers. We've got forty three people watching this feed. It's perfectly reasonable. Um, so uh, reinvent's coming up, Julian. I, I can't remember whether, whether you told me you were going to reinvent or whether you've been uh, whether you've been grounded. I yes. <laughs> I, uh, I certainly will be there. Um, I have, uh, yeah, going to be there doing a whole bunch of things. I've actually got two sessions. Um, one is a talk talk, which is sort of pretty uh, intimate, smaller group of people. And I'm doing one on observability for serverless applications. Um, yeah, so literally chat for an hour with small number of people in the room. We draw stuff out and do that. And then I've got a real deep dive into Lambda, which is, well, sorry, deep dive into serverless. Which includes Lambda, which is a sort of um, best practices for of advanced serverless developers. Um, yeah, so that's a 400 level level talk where we, I'm going to uh, 
basically grab um, tips and tricks from other clever people on Twitter, put them all together in a PowerPoint. That, that's uh, that's uh, evangelism for you, isn't it? That's the, the essence of it. Um, we do have a question from the uh, from the chat that isn't about buying followers. Um, Ivrenik, I think, uh, asks, is Lambda in containers FIPS compliant? You know, testing your general knowledge about <laughs> Lambda uh, containers. No, uh, I mean, I, I, I could check 100%, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, if Lambda is FIPS compliant, there's no difference between Lambda and containers being FIPS compliant. The only thing I will say is whatever you are sticking in that container, if you're sticking stuff that isn't FIPS compliant, you know, people ask this example, uh, you know, is it HIPAA compliant or is it, you know, credit card processing uh, compliant? Yes, the service itself is, but you need to obviously check where you move yeah, your own data. Yeah, shared responsibility. That. And another question from the group, another first time chat from uh, uh, the yes. Shrike Final Tree. Uh, is there any latency or performance impact of using containers for Lambda? Yeah, good one. Good one to ask. Um, uh, Container images for Lambda and zip archive functions are two different ways, are generally pretty much the same. And one of the reasons is, is what we've done with these bigger Lambda functions, Lambda functions is we actually cache them really close to where Lambda runs. And I think there are a few different caches depending on how hot or warm the Lambda functions are. But when you then um, upload and you create a Lambda function based on this, uh, um, on this ECR image, uh, we cache those ECR images close to you. And also remember, Container images are made up of a whole number of layers. So say you're using Python 3.9 or Node 14, you know, those layers are already going to be cached all within the Lambda service. And so um, we're not uh, literally having to pull down your whole container image. You know, 80% of it, 70% of it, 90% of it is going to be uh, probably in the cache already. And then it's just your unique bits at the end. And that's only going to be a first invocation as well. After that, that's going to be warm in the cache. So yeah, you shouldn't have a cold start penalty for um, containing image lamin. Right. And it functions. sounds like then that, that there's benefit in in me using a, an AWS provided base image because then that, that increases the likelihood of my stuff being cached close to where my function is going to run. Correct. Yes, just for the first invocation, but once it's uh, once it's been invoked once, that yeah, then gotcha. is in the cache. Uh, and one more question from the chat: XR fifty three. This might be an implementation detail you can't share, but uh, what server does serverless Lambda run on? Is it running in containers in itself? Uh, yeah, funnily enough, there are actually servers that run serverless underneath the hood. Um, and actually, we've got x86 servers, and we've actually got Graviton servers, which are our ARM-based servers. Um, so yeah, you can choose between that architecture thing, but that's a bit of, uh, a, bit of a tangent. But yeah, uh, under the hood, Lambda doesn't quite run in a container. We use some container-like technology, like C groups and things like that, to isolate uh, the Lambda function. But actually, it's running in a micro VM. So there's a cool technology we've got called Firecracker. And Firecracker actually runs a micro VM, which has hardware virtualization. And so actually, every single Lambda function runs in a micro VM. But there is some container technology with the C groups, as I mentioned, within that micro VM to make yep, it easier. Gotcha. And Firecracker is an open source project, right? We can go and look at that, install it, run it ourselves, yep. uh, build our own you know, Lambda service if you we've got that can. sort of time and, and resources on our hands. <laughs> Please. <go laughs> Excellent. Um, well, Julian, thanks for, thanks for joining us um i think that's all the uh, all the questions we've got we've got time for, for uh, maybe we'll cross paths in uh, uh, in vegas i'm going to be out there uh, all week and uh, i'm running a uh, or, or involved in running a uh, dev community uh, i think a community builders developer room or something they're calling it uh, on security and identity and i will be tweeting the details of that um when i uh, when, when we've when we've discussed what that's going to be, be which we're doing tomorrow evening uh, on on zoom so uh, thanks very much julian um hopefully we'll we'll see you again soon thanks very much great. thanks for having me